Um, but yes, my name is Sarah. Uh, the project that I'm working for, it's, uh, I'm part of the Midwells Red Squirrel Partnership, which is a partnership of multiple uh, people and organisations. I'll show them a little bit later. But the current project is the Healthy Reds Project, which is 80% um, funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund and a little bit through the UCVA, the Welsh Gov, um, the uh, Welsh Gov Landfill Tax Scheme. So some of our funding is through Landfill Tax, through Lampeter. Um, so uh, you should be able to see the screen. So here we have, this is our current team. This is me. Uh, this photo was taken last October, I think. Uh, we had a bit of a volunteer day out down in Brachra Forest. Um, there's been a, a red squirrel that was found in Brachra uh, last summer. So we were down there just to have a bit of a look around and uh, do a bit of tree ID workshop and just have a nice day out, really. Um, but yeah, this is me. Uh, on the side is Ben. Uh, he's a grey squirrel officer. He's been working with the project since about oh, 2014, I think, a few years now. And over here is Phil. He's so their roles are now split up. So Ben is grey squirrel officer west, and Phil is grey squirrel officer east. Um, and Phil only joined the project last August, but uh, he's actually been involved in the red squirrel project since the really early days. Um, he's been he's co-author on some of the really early papers from the early 2000s proving that red squirrels do still exist in mid Wales and still um, around here and deserving of conservation. Um, so it's really good to have him on the project and uh, with his knowledge and expertise. Um, and yeah with this new project we now have finally have a staff vehicle up until then we were using um, staff vehicles so we've now got our trucks if you see us around in this nicely branded truck then uh, feel free to wave us over and say hello um so this is a bit of context i know a lot of you will be from the lost peatland project which is a bit further south all of the blue blobs on this map the, little, the small ones anyway are um wildlife trust of south west wales nature reserves um and the area that i'm working in is up here so we don't really own that much, uh, not much of where we're working is nature reserve, but also it's not much owned by the Wildlife Trust. Um, so the red line is the outline of the Mid, Mid Wales Red Squirrel focal site. And the theory is that inside that red line, there are only red squirrels. And the blue surrounding line is the buffer zone. And so the theory is that we mostly work in the buffer zone to keep grey squirrels outside it. So any grey squirrels outside of this, we are kind of uh, accepting, <laughs> we, you know, we're not trying to eradicate grey squirrels from the entire UK. That's a ridiculous idea at this, at this stage anyway. Um, so grey squirrels out here, they're doing their own thing. There aren't any red squirrels, they're not doing any harm. But we try and keep the grey and the red squirrels separate uh, due to disease problems that I'll go into in a little bit later. Um, so we have this buffer zone to separate the red squirrel zone and the grey squirrel zone. Um, you'll see there isn't much, uh, there isn't at all a buffer on this northeastern edge. Um, that's because this edge is pretty much the edge of the forestry. Um, most of this area is commercial forestry. There is some agriculture down the centre of it as well. But this northern edge, it's just straight from forestry into agricultural land. So there isn't much squirrel habitat. Squirrels aren't likely to be encroaching from that direction. So we don't do too much buffer work on that edge. Um, I think that's about it for this one. Um, so, red squirrels, a uh, little bit about them. Uh, red squirrels are native to the UK. They made their way to the British Isles through mainland Europe. It's thought around the time of the last ice age, which is approximately 10,000 years ago. And they've been in the UK ever since. Um, I think, let me just see, can I, how many people can I see? Oops, go back to that one. Um, uh, I can't see many of you at a time, but um, how many people here have seen a red squirrel at all? You can pop it in the chat or do the little zoom wave thing, if you like, or just have a think and, and wave. Um, so if you think about how many people have seen red squirrels um, in the UK at all, it's very good. On Anglesey, there you go. So yeah, this is the thing. Um, in most people know what a red squirrel is. Most people know uh, 
to recognize one. They have a, an image in their mind of a red squirrel. Uh, some people have seen red squirrels, but mostly in Scotland. Fewer people have seen them. So there's, you know, some people have seen red squirrels at all. And an even smaller group have seen red squirrels in Wales. And an even smaller group have seen them in mid Wales, not very many at all. Um, so yes, mid Wales isn't very good for red squirrels. Anglesey is getting to be a good little stronghold. But the point of this is that we are really lucky that given how few people have seen red squirrels, how many people recognize them and know of them and have, you know, remember that they exist and know about them in that way. Um, so they do really have a, a cultural significance in the UK and uh, that's a really important thing. Uh, there we go. So this is the type of habitat that uh, really red squirrels would like to live in. Um, sort of broadleaf woodlands um, with uh, got uh, willows there, hazelnuts, bluebells growing underneath, this sort of typical nice image of woodlands. This is where red squirrels would like to live um, but currently in the UK this type of woodland is completely dominated by grey squirrels. Um, they eat all of the food and dominate that area so, grey, so red squirrels don't live in this sort of area at all. They are pushed to the out, outskirts. Um, a little bit about grey squirrels. So grey squirrels are non-native. They were introduced to the UK quite recently really, went in the grand scheme of things. It's about 100 years ago. Um, it's about there were multiple introductions in different places but it was mostly about 100 years ago around a 50-year period of like the late 1800s, the early 1900s um, and now they have spread absolutely everywhere um, apart from the northern reaches of Scotland and some of the west of Ireland are still we still uh, not have too many of them. But uh, the actual population of grey squirrels is a very hard thing to know because, as you can imagine, they're kind of everywhere, but how do you know how many they are? They all look the same. You see three in some person's garden and five in another garden, and are those the same or are they different? So it's, it's quite hard to know how many they are, but the current estimate is anywhere between two and a half, three million. Uh, grey squirrels in the UK. Meanwhile, red squirrels, the population has fallen to about 120,000 um, and of those it's only about one to two thousand that are thought to be in Wales but again even though they're not as widely spread as the grey squirrels they are still, it's still hard to know how many there are because there's so few of them that again it's really hard to know those numbers uh, when they're living at such low densities. Um, and there is a lot of interaction between the grey and the red squirrels. Um, I've got some maps that I'll show in a little bit, but the main, main things are competitive exclusion, so eating all the food, that sort of thing, and the squirrel pox virus. And I'll talk about both of those in a second. Um, so this next slide is a little bit graphic. Um, if you don't want to see something gory, then I would uh, just look away from your screen. I won't stay on it too long, so just look away from your screen and I'll, I'll say when it's safe to look back. Um, but these, these images are the effect of squirrel pox on red squirrels. It's, um, it's often said to be quite similar to myxomatosis in rabbits, you know, these skin lesions around the eyes and the nose and all of the orifices and um, it, uh, it doesn't do well for them. Um, red squirrels aren't, I don't think there's any evidence of any uh, resistance to it, they pretty much just tend to die from it, but they don't actually tend to die from the disease, they tend to starve to death because they can't feed themselves. Um, grey squirrels, I've, I've moved on to the next slide, so if anyone's looking away, you can look back now. Um, but grey squirrels will carry the squirrel pox, but they don't tend to be affected by it. There are some examples when grey squirrels are living in really high densities with a really high level of squirrel pox in the population that they have been susceptible to it, but generally grey squirrels don't seem to be affected by it, but it is really really bad for the red squirrels and it's a horrible uh, disease which can last quite a long time in the environment, so we do have to use some quite horrible chemicals to clean it off if you've got a, a feeder station for example where you're feeding squirrels. If a grey squirrel comes to that you have to spray that with some pretty nasty stuff to clean it before you would morally be able to put it back out for red squirrels to use. Um, 
but yeah, this is a bit of a comparison between red and gray squirrels. So you can see there's some size difference, um, tail length and body size difference. The weight is particularly significant. So gray squirrels are offered about twice the weight of red squirrels. Um, obviously, you know, a young gray squirrel might only be three, 350 grams, but it would be a pretty healthy red squirrel if it's anywhere over 300 grams. Um, so that just means that gray squirrels need a lot more food, but they also eat a lot more food. Um, so this is sort of playing into the situation we're in now, where the areas that the red squirrels are living in, they're living in Sitka spruce commercial forestry plantations. Now, Sitka spruce isn't great squirrel habitat. That's, uh, it's um, easy to think that that's where red squirrels like to live, but it's just where gray squirrels aren't. Gray squirrels don't tend to go to Sitka spruce plantations because why would they? They are dominating all of the broadleaf forests. They can steal the peanuts from your bird feeders at home. Um, so gray squirrels go for where there's lots of food, whereas red squirrels are pushed to the edges. There are going to be sick of spruce plantations where the spruce cones got these tiny little seeds, which are hardly worth their while for the gray squirrels. But for the red squirrels, they can just about work out a living up there. Uh, red, gray squirrels also live in a much higher density, um, often about 15 individuals per hectare, whereas red squirrels it's only two to three. They are, um, they do things a little bit more sparsely. Um, there's the disease issue and then their diets, they're broadly the same, but with some, some differences. Um, red squirrels do eat fungi as well. I don't think there's any evidence of red squirrels eating nestlings, but I, I wouldn't swear down on that. You never know, um, a lot of these things are opportunists. Um, but gray squirrels do have a significant impact on a, a lot of forestry through bark stripping, particularly when gray squirrels are living in high density um, and in broadleaf woodlands. Um, so gray squirrels can be a real problem if you're um, in little areas in England, they're planting um, lots of broadleaf forests, you know, planting trees, climate change, all of that. Um, and a lot of these are being really badly affected by high gray squirrel densities where the gray squirrels are bark stripping the other trees and uh, doesn't always kill the tree, but it can really warp its growth and um, have a bad issue for it. There we go. Right now it's a little pop quiz time. So here we have five images of squirrels. Up until now, I have very deliberately chosen images of red squirrels that look red and gray squirrels that look gray, because that would be great if that was the case. However, unfortunately, as with many things in nature, things aren't that quite close cut. Things aren't quite that well divided. So. Um, Often red squirrels will have grey coats and grey squirrels will have red coats, which is very good fun for identifying. So, so what am I going to on? So here we have these five images. So have a think, have a look at them all, um, see if you can make, have a hazard a guess as to which ones you think are which. And I'll start popping up the answers now. So first we're going to go for this top left one up here. Um, this one is red. So he's got a grey coat, but he has got these red um, red face and arms, but he's got these ear tufts, which are quite a good thing to look out for. Uh, then we've got this chap, he is a grey, he's got a lot of red coat, but he's actually grey. I think next we're going down to this bottom left, he's got quite warm tones to his coat, that is also grey. And now this chap, the dark one, that one's a red, and these two with the orange bits in the tail are also grey. So, um, a couple of the features that are generally best to look out for are ear tufts and tail halo. Um, red squirrels quite often have these ear tufts and grey squirrels quite often have this tail halo. So you can see this sort of, there's the, the gingery bit in the centre but then there's kind of a black border and then a white border. Uh, you can kind of see it here as well and see it here. Um, and the ear tufts I don't think I've ever seen a grey squirrel with ear tufts. I don't think it happens, but I wouldn't throw down because you know what nature's like. You can always have just one individual that throws you off. Um, but ear tufts is generally a red squirrel trait. However, here we have a red squirrel with no ear tufts. So you can't rely on ear tufts. Um, it's very common to have red squirrels without ear tufts. So I don't tend to recommend that as your main feature. I am guilty of saying that tail halo is the thing to go for. If you see a tail halo, you've got a grey squirrel. If you don't, you've got a red squirrel. Easy. Well, that's what I thought anyway. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I've got a photo I'll show you in a second that uh, undermined everything again. Um, so yeah, just going back to this one, you've got the, 
these greys often have the tail halo, but what reds will often have, which this one does, is just a pale tip or a white band or something, um, but it's kind of a slightly different, it doesn't have the halo edge done, effect on the edge. Um, this is a screen grab from one of our feeder cameras in Mid Wales, up in Cumberland near Tregaron. And uh, you can see this, it's got a dark core to the tail and it's got a white edge, but it's not really a tail halo. But it, I mean, if uh, I deliberately took this screen grab where you couldn't see the body, because the body of the squirrel is very red. It's quite obviously a red squirrel. But yes, I, I was guilty of uh, generally saying tail halo is the best feature to look for. It's, it's a pretty good viable feature. And then I was uh, looking at some red squirrel resources online and I saw this lovely image which is obviously a red squirrel, despite it not having ear tufts. But that looks like if you were looking at this, if you were using the tail as your one feature, if that was your distinguishing feature, you'd look at this and say it was a grey squirrel. And it, it obviously isn't, so we're lucky that it's attached to a nice red body. Um, but yeah, it just shows to show that often in nature, you can't just use one feature, you have to use a combination of things, and partly it does help to know what area you're in. Uh, we do get red squirrel reports coming in from all over the place, and it, but then it is quite hard to know. It's hard to know with these reports. Are those just red squirrels that are dispersing or relic populations, or are they just confusing grey squirrels with nice red coats? Um, so here's a few more maps showing the general trend and bit of history. So like I say, grey squirrels were introduced uh, early 1900s. By 1945, you've got red squirrels have completely exited. <laughs> there are no longer any red squirrels in southeastern England. Uh, the grey squirrels are starting to encroach into Wales and coming in in the northeast. Scotland is pretty much purely red. Ireland is mostly doing okay. Then by 2010, you've got grey squirrels, pretty much whole of England. Red squirrels are still doing okay in Northern Scotland and Western Ireland. But the fact that these boundaries shift together, that you have grey squirrels, then mix, then red squirrels, and that's shifting, that, do, that is extra evidence that it is a causal link. Um, it's not just coincidence. Um, it is a related fact. Um, one leads to the other. Uh, so this is, uh, just bringing it back down to Wales, this image is taken from, I think it's the 2009 um, squirrel uh, action plan, when um, they decided to take red squirrels in Wales a bit more seriously, and um, by this point they had already managed to clean up Anglesey, so there were no longer any grey squirrels in Anglesey, uh, so you've got just reds on Anglesey, and then these black areas, areas that were suspected to be grey squirrel, uh, sorry, red squirrel populations, but the black areas, uh, which includes Brechfer down here, were thought to be there just wasn't enough evidence um, to show properly that um, there was still a thriving population or an existing population of red squirrels there. So they were uh, left out of the ongoing action plan. And this red area here is us. This is uh, the Mid Wales Red Squirrel site. And you can see that we classify as red and grey. We cannot claim to be grey free. Um, and there's also Clickenog in North Wales. Um, and in the early days of the red, Mid Wales Red Squirrel project, this is what we were dealing with. You're working in dark, dank, steep forest up in the hills, lots of midges, and you would have a tiny, tiny, tiny chance of seeing a red squirrel. So in this photo, there is a red squirrel in the photo. So I'll give you a few seconds to see if you can spot it. Actually, since you did, it's here, in the tree here. So this is really what it was like at the start. Um, but thankfully things have improved slightly since then. Um, but as I was saying a little bit earlier, this is sort of the kind of forestry that people tend to assume that red squirrels thrive in, because this is where red squirrels are found, um, you know, spruce and pine plantations. Uh, this is an, an image from one of our trail cameras, and there is actually another red squirrel in this one here. We've got a little red squirrel just running behind this tree. Um, but this sort of shows the area that we tend to be walking in. It's quite mossy, quite wet. Um, lots of brushy branches and uh, mostly just sick spruce. 
Um, and it's easy to assume that this is where great red squirrels want to be. And this is the habitat of red squirrels. But it's a very difficult one because, as I was saying earlier, the, hab the best habitat for red squirrels is a broadleaf forest, but those are full of grey squirrels. So for conservation for red squirrels, you kind of have to make the habitat not very good for squirrels, because as soon as it's a good squirrel habitat, you've just got grey squirrels there. So it's a very difficult uh, balancing act, trying to get things right. Um, this is a bit of aerial photography um, taken from Bing, I think, um, of our focal site. So um, the focal site is this whole area. So as you can see, not the entire area is forestry. There's a lot of agricultural land in the middle as well, which does mean it's quite patchy and it's not very good um, connectivity always. But we've kind of got this, e uh, this western branch here, uh, core zone here, this is the Toei Forest, and then we've got the uh, western patch over here. But um, I'm just focusing on this bit a little bit more so you can see how easily all these pale shapes that you can see within this forestry, these are areas that have been clear felt. And then when you zoom in on the satellite imagery, um, it uh, updates with some might, slightly more recent uh, um, satellite imagery. So this is the same area again, but it's almost a bit unrecognisable. So I'll just go back. So if you look at this shape here, where you've got this um, little sort of almost a, a G or a C shape, um, just to the west of our Vagressin, that is here. So um, what's happened between these two images have been taken is all of this area that was clear felt has been planted. Um, and so it's no longer bare ground. It's got young trees growing on it, but these young trees won't be any really much use to the red squirrels. They might be tall enough that they will be a useful corridor and habitat link, and they might be able to use that for cover and for getting from A to B, um, but they, those trees won't be producing any food, they won't be producing any seed, so they won't be any good for that. And you can see that more areas have been clear felled as well, um, so it is really patchy, it's really, there's pinch points where there's no connectivity between areas which is a real concern because when you've got a small population, um, their habitat is more and more fragmented, then you've got the issue that they might not be able to meet, which is an essential part of conservation, is making sure two animals can meet. I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> um, but we are very lucky, uh, the Mid-Wales Red Squirrel Partnership is a partnership. Um, currently, Wildlife Trust South West Wales, we're taking the lead role. We've got this funding grant, um, it's myself and Ben and Phil working on the project but uh, the partnership we meet uh, about four times a year and with all these partners on board, we've got the Cumbrian Mountains, Basque, County Councils, Natural Resources Wales, PRS, Scottish Woodland, Till Hill, they're all forest managers uh, select for as well. So we've, we've got forest managers on board with us and a really good relationship with them. So we can have good discussions about uh, which areas of forestry are going to be felled, what we can do about it. We can survey beforehand if we see evidence of red squirrels and we can try and, um, like for instance recently uh, NRW were going to be felling an area in Clwydog and it was larch felling, it wasn't just felling for the plan, it was larch felling so it had to be done for disease control um, and we were able to have really good conversation with them about that and they uh, uh, protected several trees that had drays in. Um, we didn't couldn't know if the red squirrels were currently using them. There were red squirrels in the area and there were drays, so we had to assume that they were active. So those trees were left standing with several trees around them to, to protect them, um, which just meant that any red squirrels there, they could hunk down, they'd be safe. They wouldn't be actively harmed by the felling. Obviously a lot of habitat is being lost, but in some cases we can't always do anything about that. But at least the actual squirrels themselves should have remained safe and been able to then make their way out of that area and set up a new, uh, new area somewhere else. There we go. So, um, a few years back, camera trap technology started to get a bit more useful and uh, we started experimenting that with that uh, early in the project. Um, the classic way to use camera traps for squirrel surveying is to put up feeding stations, so like these, you might have seen videos of them on the internet, so this lid is hinged, it's often a bit of um, 
recycled bike in a tube or a bit of plastic or something that's making this hinge. The scroll sits on here, lifts up the lid, gets the food out from inside. Um, it produces some wonderful images where like here, the red scroll has to learn how to use one of these feeders. If it hasn't met it before, it has to learn how to use it. Um, and sometimes it takes them a little while. Um, and these were partially successful. We've still got one, I showed you an image of earlier actually, we've still got one feeder station that we're using in Mid Wales, but most of them we've now taken down. We don't tend to use them. Uh, great use in Scotland and in Anglesey, but what we found in Mid Wales was if you put up a feeder full of nuts and seeds, what it would do is it would draw in grey scrolls from outside the core zone, which is obviously not what we want to do. There's the real disease transmission risk of doing that. Um, and even if the grey scrolls didn't get drawn into it, um, there's the pine martins in mid Wales now, and uh, they don't say no to a nice tasty snack of some peanuts. So we would just have endless footage of a pine martin sitting on the feeder eating great nuts, which is obviously not, a, not something anyone's going to be too upset about. But when our goal is to survey for red squirrels, it wasn't very productive. And in the end, we actually discovered that we'd have a feeder with a pine martin sitting on it, eating away. And we didn't get a single bit of red squirrel footage. And then we put up a camera just pointing at the ground about 50 meters away, and we got red squirrel footage from there. So if there were red squirrels in the area, they just weren't using the feeder, which might well be to do with this predator avoidance. So we just found for, for us, for our situation, where we've got um, squirrels and pine martins and feeders weren't very effective for surveying. So what we started doing, uh, we'd go out into the woods and look for, this would be the classic thing where you've got a nice mossy stump with a bit of visibility and um, cones on top of it which have been chewed. You can see some uh, scales from the cones that have already been eaten along the side here. I think I can turn this up if I can do some play. And it was really effective. We started getting some really, really nice footage of red squirrels using the um, using these areas. And so we weren't baiting them. We don't put any bait out generally, um, just because of that risk of drawing in gray squirrels. We just look for areas that are already being used by red squirrels and we'll put a camera pointing at that. And that really helped the, bring us in more, more records. So uh, this is a uh, map of our sightings. This is on our website, so you can go and have a look at that if you'd like. Um, I can put a link to that in the chat in a few minutes as well, if you like. Um, this is the sightings map from our website. This is sightings from all time. So you can see I got one recently from near Ludlow. Didn't really know what to do about that. I did contact the chap and ask, and he was very confident it was a red squirrel. It could be, but it's quite unlikely. But um, I mean, if it is, there aren't any red squirrel groups anywhere near there. So uh, I'm not sure what can be done about it. Um, there are some further down South Wales. Some of these are historical ones. So if you go onto our website, you can hover over each of these or click on them and you can get more details. You can see when the sighting was. Um, and so that. Obviously, most of our sightings are clustered around this Mid Wales zone, the focal site zone. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think in 2020 so far, I think I've had, I think maybe now it's more about 10, maybe a dozen records that have been sent in by people, as in when a, a person has seen a red squirrel and sent in the record to me. But I've had far more than that through um, cameras that we're monitoring. So uh, we really do, are getting much more uh, records just from these cameras. And a really good way of surveying for something like red squirrels um, but it does take a bit of time and effort and you have to make a few mistakes at the beginning before you learn how to do it and with all things. Um, so this, this footage, I was just trying to put in some nice footage for you guys really, but this one is one of my favourites. Again, you can see this squirrel's got a nice really white tip at the end of its tail. I'll play it again once it gets to the end of it. Um, but this one was a, a really nice one for me because this was just after I started in the role. Um, I took over from Becky, who'd been running this project for the last few years. I took over in late September and uh, we put out some cameras and not got anything and then put up some more cameras and didn't hold much hope. I'd taken the cameras home, put them down my office and I hadn't checked them immediately. And then a couple of days later, just while I was having a cup of tea, I picked up one of the cameras completely at random, just picked the first one off the top of the pile, switched it on, went to playback mode and saw this. And that was a real moment for me of, oh, we are doing it, okay, we are getting them. They are, they are here. 
um, we're picking up. And this was actually an area that red squirrels hadn't been seen in about five years, so that was good to see. Um, so, uh, like I was saying with the map, um, mid Wales isn't, I still wouldn't recommend mid Wales as a place to go and see red squirrels. Obviously, if you like a challenge, come on up once you're allowed to, of course. Um, but mid Wales isn't a good place to be reliably seeing them. We don't get many records coming in and uh, when people do tend to see them, it um, doesn't tend to be people who are actually looking for them. The camera trapping works quite well, but um, the red squirrels are up in the, right in the sort of commercial forestry. Uh, they don't tend to be in um, very well walked areas, which might lead into it as well. It's sort of a combination of their living where there aren't many people um, and they're avoiding people a bit. So it's hard to know which is the true thing. But we do occasionally get some really nice, really nice things sent in. So this was right at the beginning of lockdown, early May. Uh, Suzanne Lander, who lives near Lampeter, sent me sent me a message on Facebook. She said, oh, I've seen a red scroll. I've got some photos. Can I send them to you? And I was like, sure. I didn't have high expectations, um, to be honest. And then she sent me these amazing images. She'd been walking in Cluedog, just the east of Lampeter, um, which is an area that we do have a lot of red scroll records. We, uh, that's one of our best places at the minute for records. And yeah, the three amazing images of red scroll. So she's really, really lucky. Um, but I'd say it's probably once a year or less that somebody sees a red squirrel and gets these amazing images. Um, hopefully that'll become more common, but that's still not a very, uh, not very common thing, unfortunately, for mid Wales. Um, this is another video for you. This is from end of last summer, and this is a really exciting clip. This is again in Cluedog, because if you saw that, I'll play it again in a second. Um, this we've got one, two, three, four red squirrels all in one clip, which is amazing stuff. Um, with conservation, especially when you're working with a low population, one of the most important things is that they are individuals or from this population are able to bump into each other and do what they do. Uh, so it's really good to see four in one shot. Um, red squirrels aren't, don't tend to vary much in coat or colour. Um, so it's quite hard to know how many you've got. We can be camera trapping over a large area and unless you get multiple in the shot at the same time, you kind of have to assume that you might only have one. It might just be one doing a big old loop covering that whole area. Um, so it's always good to get multiple in the same shot. So uh, now I'm just going to do a bit of an overview of camera trapping in case anyone is interested in doing a bit more of that themselves. Um, these are the camera traps we have. I've got uh, better images on, on the next slide. Um, but they are Browning Recon Force Advantage. Um, they come with a strap. You can buy a mount for them where it's a, a metal plate which you strap onto the tree and then an adjustable pivoting arm so you can point it up, down, whatever way. Um, they are quite expensive, these mounts though, and to be honest, generally if you point a camera up, it just gets completely uh, silhouette too much exposure from the sun and, and it, you don't very often get very good footage. So we've used those a couple of times when we've been trying to get images of scrolls using a dray, but often it's quite difficult to do. So generally we'll put them anywhere between 50 centimetres and a metre up on the base of a tree and you want to angle them down slightly unless they're on a hill. Um, and we generally will just use a couple of branches, uh, the gold branches from the floor, or if you've uh, taken any branches off the tree to, to clear the view for your camera, then uh, we just wedge them in the top, pull the strap tight and that angles of the camera down. These cameras are really good ones to go for. One of the most important things I would say when looking at the camera is the, the screen is on this bit. So we did have some old um, the Cronova um, cameras, I've got some in the box I can show you in a minute if you like, um, but the entire front of the camera opened and the screen was on the door and the cameras were fine but the biggest problem with them was that setting them up was really difficult because you've strapped the back of the camera to the tree and then you're look, trying to work out what the camera is seeing but with those cameras it's impossible to look at the screen and see what the camera is seeing when the door's shut um, so it makes it quite difficult to position whereas these ones you've got the screen on here so you just sit off, sit yourself off to the side look have a peer around and you can see I'll quite often like put my hand on the bit that I'm trying to see. I'm like, can I see my hand in shot? And if I can see my hand in shot, then I know that a squirrel 
sitting on that bit of ground will be in shot. Um, pros and cons of these ones. Um, so they, these uh, have come down in price a little bit now. There's a newer model that's come out, which is a little bit better, but it also means that these ones are a little bit cheaper. And these are really good, really good cameras. Um, they are pretty good. I don't have many criticisms of them. This is another one I've got here. Uh, one thing to be wary of if you do get these exact ones, um, in the bottom here, there's the eject button. And if I hit, press that and it ejects the battery tray, that eject button is a bit easy to press. So sometimes you might press that and eject the batteries when you don't mean to. But that only ejects them to here, and then you've got to yank them out, and it's a bit of a solid hold. And uh, you know, they're quite solid plastic things, so um, you have to do a bit of a yank to pull them out. Uh, the only other criticism I have of them is you'll see in the camera footage that uh, they have the American date on them, which I find incredibly frustrating. So this was from the 21st of March, this bit of footage. And uh, this is just a what not to do. So you don't want to do what I did here, which is I strapped this camera to a wobbly tree. And uh, so I just had a lot of footage to look through of this, where it's been triggered because there's movement. And uh, the movement was the camera. And it picked up 385 videos 10 second long videos of the tree wobbling. So I wouldn't recommend that. Um, most cameras will have uh, three modes. They have trail camera where they're triggered by movement and they will take a photo. And you can set how many photos they take, how long between photos, everything like that. Video mode where they're triggered by movement and they'll take a video. Again, you can set how long the video is, how long the gap is. Or you can have them on time-lapse mode. And there are some studies looking at using this time-lapse mode to survey for animals. I think it works quite well for deer, things like that. Um, you just take a photo every half an hour and see what you get. Um, but generally, we tend to use them on these uh, movement triggered modes, either video or trail cam. If you do that, the first lesson you have to learn is not to put anything moving, <laughs> um, not to put the camera on anything that will wobble, and um, not to have anything too wobbly in front. So with these ones, the branch in front was also a little bit wobbly, so that triggered it a little bit as well. Um, if you put it too low, then you'll get blades of grass moving in front of the sensor and triggering it, sometimes a big bush. Um, sometimes, you know, it'll only happen on a really windy day, and that might be a sacrifice worth making for a good area. Um, but it is a bit of trial and error finding a good spot, and once you find a good spot, you have to, to stick with it. But you can find get some amazing um, footage through these cameras. So here, it's right at the beginning of the clip, it's gone already, I'll have to wait for it to cycle around before I can play it again. Um, but here we've got a red squirrel and it's got a cone in its mouth and uh, it's just uh, doing some foraging. So again, this is uh, October last year. So this was autumn nut caching time. So it was looking for somewhere to bury that spruce cone further hard winter ahead. Um, so yes, that is about it. I can, I'll just play this video and if anyone's got any questions, um, we can go through some of them. Um, I can do, talk more about uh, camera traps as well if you want. Uh, we've got a few questions here. Um, we've got how long do the batteries last on a camera trap? Uh, could you set it up over the weekend? Mm. Oh absolutely. So these ones, um, I mean I think technology is improving and improving and they're getting better and better. Um, I don't know how much it is to do with the battery and how much it is to do with the camera but these ones are amazing. Um, so we do, we get the proper goods, the, the expensive lithium ion batteries in these. And uh, I, those, this camera, that camera that uh, I showed in the last clip that picked up nearly 400 videos, that was up for three weeks, picked, recorded 400 10 second long videos. And when I picked it up, I think it still said 90, oh, it was definitely over 90% battery. These batteries can last months and months and months when they're firing a lot. Um, I think if you're using alkaline batteries, they still last a couple of months. So yeah, over a weekend, absolutely easy. They're, they're really incredible things. Brilliant. We have uh, Andy's recommended, he's been using uh, Picture Mini and the batteries last ages, even when I had a leaf moving in front and it was triggered over 300 times. I've had it out for weeks and still the same battery. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very nice. I, I meant to say actually as well when I was uh, showing the that uh, the cameras that we've got that the website. I can go back to it. Um, this website, Nature Spy. This is the website we use. Um, 
so uh, I, yeah, I would definitely recommend Nature Spy. They're, they're a really good company and they do a lot of conservation work and um, they, I think they do discounts and bulk orders and things, but um, yeah, they, they've been really good for us uh, and they have got some, they've got a camera chooser up here so you can uh, see, uh, have, a, sort of have a click through and see, see what camera suits your needs and see what you want to do with it. And they've got a good range and they've got really good good advice and things. So yeah, I definitely, if you think about getting some cameras, I'd have a contact them or have a look on their website and, and see if there's anything that floats your boat. Oh, they look brilliant. Uh, I've got a question from Hannah here. Have you found that where the numbers of pine martins have increased, the numbers of gray scorers have decreased? Um, through what we're doing, not really. Um, anecdotally, possibly, I've had people in Devil's Bridge saying that they think that they, they've seen far fewer grey squirrels. Um, there have been a lot of studies on this. Um, there's been studies from Ireland and uh, Kat McNichol, who was, did her PhD through the Vincent Wildlife Trust, who were uh, responsible for bringing the, the pine martins down. Um, she actually wrote a paper on the interactions. Um, Anecdotally, I, th I do think that there's been changes in movements. I think that um, where the pine martins have sort of set up shop, the squirrel distribution has changed. Um, and there is evidence of uh, pine martins predating grey squirrels, but the pine martins currently aren't at a very high density. Um, I think generally the, the thought is that the pine martins would need to be a much higher density to actively make a make a dent in the grey squirrel population you know grey squirrels are still a really high density in whales and pine martins aren't so they're not going to be making much of a dent the grey squirrels are still going to be topping themselves back up quite easily um so yeah i don't think that they're making a, a huge impact on the grey squirrel population but so they're not they're not an act they're not a, a viable form of grey squirrel control we can't just leave it to the pine martins to do that job for us unfortunately um but yeah they they, they will take grey squirrels Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I've got a lovely question here from Lewis. I have some land just outside your buffer zone. Is there anything I can do to support the red squirrels? Ooh, yeah, quite possibly. So um, it depends how close you are. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we have plenty of volunteers um, in and around the buffer zone. We've got um, something you, as a uh, hopefully once we can go back to doing nice volunteer work again. At the minute, it's been a bit difficult. Um, but yeah, we've got one volunteer who lives a couple of hours away and he wanted to volunteer. So he just goes through hours and hours of camera tap footage for us. We just, the, the feeder camera that we've got um, gets a lot of footage. There's about four or five red squirrels using it currently. So we, we post him the SD cards and he goes through those images for us, those videos for us, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, if someone's so close, there's, uh, there's definitely an opportunity. Um, there's quite a few different options of um, Depending on, depending on where the land is and uh, what the volunteers we've got in the area. So um, yeah, if Lewis wants to send me an email um, and uh, we'll see where, where his land is, where it fits with the mosaic of our current volunteers, then yeah, we'd probably be able to find something that would work, definitely. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, I've got one more on here. Uh, are all landowners on board with grey squirrel control in the buffer zone? Not currently, no. Um, obviously, it's a really emotive subject. It's a really difficult thing. Um, and it's not something that anyone wants to do. No one says, oh, I want to go and kill things. No, no one, no one wants to do it. Um, so, no, um, they're, they're, we've got quite a few um, people that we've spoken to who are on board with it generally, but they didn't feel like they could do it with their kids. They didn't feel like they were able to navigate that conversation with them. Um, so there are people who sort of said that they'll help, but then actually being like, actually, I don't think I can do this. And that's completely fair enough. Um, so no, at the minute it's not, it's not like it's, it's de and it's not a compulsory thing anyway. We're, we just uh, see what we can do. Um, but no, it's, it's not a compulsory thing and not everyone is involved with that at all. Um, I don't think we have anyone who's actively against it though. We don't have anyone who's like chucking grey squirrels out in their back gardens in the buffer zone just to undermine us or anything like that. Uh, Ill relations, we're really lucky in Midwales, so uh, the relations are really good and everyone, everyone's on board. Everyone can support, everyone does support in whatever ways they can, which obviously is different for different people. 
Brilliant. Thank you. I've got another question here from Ruth. When areas of conifer are clear felled, are there conifer species that are a bit better for reds than others for replanting? Yes, definitely. Um, but again, it's this ridiculous balancing act that we've got to do um, because we kind of need there to be the better seed species, but we don't want there to be too many. Um, so the pines are really good, um, but the problem with the pines is they're really slow growing. So um, Scots pine, uh, lodgepole pine, will often look for these pine areas that are surrounded by six spruce to do a bit of survey work because they have better seeds for squirrels. But again, if it's too close to a boundary where there are red, uh, gray squirrels nearby, then the gray squirrels might come into that area as well. So um, yeah, when, when we're talking to the forest, forestry workers and advising them on replanting, we actually, which is, it's really counterintuitive, but we advise against planting broad leaves like oaks and willows and hazel because those will bring in the gray squirrels. Those will support gray squirrels um, setting up living in, in the red squirrel vocal site. Um, we, we do recommend pines, but um, in sort of dispersed areas um, to support the red squirrels without making it to like a honey pot of, of um, food for, that would bring in the greys. Okay, thank you. It's quite a balancing act you guys have to play. Uh, next oh, it's, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, next question from Rachel. Uh, we're not gonna go into this in any depth today, but I don't think we should avoid it. It's how do you control grey squirrel numbers in the buffer zone? Um, so currently we have a network of volunteers uh, who live um, in the buffer zone who are on board with the Red Squirrel Conservation and um, in on their own land we provide them with humane traps. Um, uh, I think this, this is quite a, a common thing uh, like for, for squirrel control um, live cap traps are the only um, acceptable thing but personally I, I'm on board with it anyway I think if you're ever going to control a species I think live traps are the only way to go because if you've ever got like a mouse trap even you don't know what's going to go in there and you might end up killing things that you don't need to kill um, don't intend to kill which I think is a completely the wrong way to go about it so we have um, humane traps which are um, protected uh, we put a, a windproofing layer um, a sack or a, or a plastic bag or something around the outside and um, some vegetation, some um, moss and things to keep it warm um, and bait them with uh, peanuts and maize. And um, these traps, once they're set, so the, the volunteer trappers um, trap in their own gardens, generally in their own land. Um, sometimes we'll have one trapper who, who goes to his neighbor's gardens as well, for example. Um, but generally it's in their own gardens in small areas and the traps are checked twice a day, every day. If you're not going to check them, you have to close them or lock them open. Obviously, you don't want an animal going in there when you can't check it. So all, always check the traps. Um, and any bycatch, um, occasionally hedgehogs, um, polecats, pine martins, um, jays go in there quite a lot, even woodpeckers occasionally, um, release them straight away. Um, and if there's a grey squirrel, then we have a, a, a humane way of, of, of dispatching them. Um, but there's a couple of different methods, depending on who it is, um, depending on how, how they're comfortable doing it. Um, but obviously, there's, it's quite a well-controlled thing. Um, you, it's illegal to release a grey squirrel. It's illegal to transport a grey squirrel. It's illegal to drown a grey squirrel. So um, the laws are quite strict on what you can do with this. And uh, you... Only the humane methods are are allowed, let alone advised. Um, so yeah, we we'll train up volunteers to make sure that they know how to do it in a humane way and um, are comfortable doing it in a calm, controlled, humane way. But yeah, it's not it's not a fun thing. No one looks forward to it. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and speak if you want. Uh, otherwise, keep popping them in the chat. That's a brilliant little tail popping behind that tree there. Mm. Yeah, it's a real Christmas shot, isn't it? Slightly mistimed, but oh well. <laughs> it's a shame. I, I um, tried to get this to work the other day with audio, but I couldn't get it to play the audio. But um, 
in these shots, this Red Scrolls, um, you can see he's kind of stamping, but he's also making a little chatting noise, like chat, chat, chat. Um, so that's a bit of a, um, it could be territorial. I think there's a Red Scroll nearby and he's saying, this is my feeder, oh. keep off it, my food. Um, but yeah, they are, they are good fun things to watch. It's a shame we can't have more feeders. Um, it's a shame they don't, uh, don't work so well for us in mid Wales. But yeah, we have, we have got one feeder um, up in Cumberin where um, just through luck and random chance, and as far as I can tell, um, there are no grey scrolls anywhere near it. No grey scrolls have ever found it. And um, the pine martens haven't found it either. So for now, that is, uh, that's been up for a, a bit over a year and uh, gets us some very nice red scroll footage. We just had another question pop in. Sorry, I'm just laughing away at that one in the feeder. It's brilliant, mm. brilliant image. Uh, sorry, <laughs> what are the main predators of the red squirrel? Oh, I don't actually know um, main predators. Um, it's they, they're quite, I think they're quite unpredated really. I think predators aren't the main threat to them if you make, if that makes sense the, that's not the the main cause of death that's what i'm trying to get at <laughs> um uh but pine martins will take red squirrels they uh pine martins will will take whatever is prevalent they will take what there is lots of so while in scotland pine martins will predate red squirrels it's very unlikely that they'll take any in mid wales because they're small they're fast and there aren't many of them so that, that they're not gonna pine martins aren't specialist um specialist predators they're not specialized in in killing gray squirrels either squirrels they they just take what is there so they'll eat berries and nuts and mushrooms and whatever there's lots of instead of trying to chase down that one red squirrel that's bombed off in the distance um i'm sure foxes will take them um the red squirrel that turned that we found in brachva was brought to a lady's door by her cat um, we still have that squirrel in a freezer. Uh, we're hoping to get it tested for squirrel pox and other diseases to find out if that squirrel was ill, um, because that would just be good to know. Uh, it could well be that it was ill with squirrel pox or some other disease, and that meant that it was a bit uh, slower to escape and was caught by the cat. But cats are a concern. Um, obviously, currently the red squirrels are in not a very well populated area, so that uh, isn't too much of a concern for us right now. But as things spread out, that could be a concern. Um, cats would be an issue. Um, birds of prey can take them as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, they're not that badly predated so at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, the chat has yeah, Thank you, everybody. Questions. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Uh, um, if anyone has thinks of anything after we're done, uh, Laura, sorry, Sarah has popped her email in the chat, uh, but you can also contact us through the Lost Peatlands and we can pass any queries on. Um, but yeah, it looks like we are done. Lots of thank yous popping up in the text. Uh, uh, if anyone wants to unmute and just yell out thanks for an amazing talk and for the absolutely gorgeous footage, then go for it. <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I've got to read this one out from Thank Andy. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the talk. Go Red Squirrels. Yes, absolutely. It's a you like flying team. We'll get team yeah. colours and. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, okay, I think we'll leave it there then because I think the, the questions have kind of died off now. So yeah, thank you again for taking the time out, Sarah. I know a lot of your colleagues are on furlough, so your job is expanded a lot recently. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come give us a talk. Yeah. Today. <laughs> That's quite all right. That's, thank you very much. <laughs>